Welcome back. Now this is a continuation of our previous video where we replaced all eight capacitors on my Macintosh Classic logic board. At the end of that video, we realized that we had solved one problem but not quite solved the other issue. Now the problem that we did solve is suddenly our floppy drive was beginning to function as it's supposed to, which was wonderful. I was glad. That worked. Yay! Unfortunately, the audio problem was not entirely solved. One of the remaining issues with the audio circuitry is that the volume control was no longer linear. Normally, steps 1 through 7, or 0 through 7, should gradually increase the volume as the slider is moved up. Unfortunately, we had a situation where there was heavy distortion at higher volumes and kind of a mild distortion at lower volumes. And further, 1 through 7 were not necessarily raising the volume in, in a consecutive order. So, for example, position number 2 was louder than position number 4, and it was just really odd. So I posed the question to my viewers, and I haven't really read all the responses yet, but I got some very interesting theories of why this was happening, and a lot of, a lot of it focused on wiring harness problems, possibly wrong value capacitors. I think one person suggested that the speaker was bad. But I've already just proven those theories because the symptom existed not only in the built-in speaker but also from the audio jack, which kind of eliminates a lot of those other theories. But I thank you for your, for your thoughts and, and definitely never stop thinking because that is how we solve problems in the real world. That sounded really douchey, didn't it? I didn't mean it that way. I swear to God. I love you guys. <laughs> I don't mean it to sound that way. Anyway, one of, the pro one of the common solutions to issues with these classic Macintoshes, specifically the Classic, the Classic 2, and even the LC2, because they're built all this, basically the same way, one of the most common theories or common solutions that people have found uh, when dealing with checkerboard pattern issues, sound issues, and even just weirdness like we experienced with the floppy drive, the solution is to pull the motherboard out and wash it, either in a dishwasher or in a kitchen sink. Now, I did this many years ago in one of my old Classic 2s, which I should have kept, but I didn't, and it actually did work. And there's a reason it worked. And there's also a reason why it won't continue working, which is why my Classic 2 eventually died again anyway. Here's why. So, capacitors. Capacitors are passive components. They pretty much just sort of sit there and electricity flows in and out of them. When things are good, they do their job. Everybody's happy. Nobody complains. These chips here, these are considered active components. If you want more information on active versus passive and what it means, I suggest you search Wikipedia. I believe there's a great article on that. There's also some great articles on capacitors, the differences between the types, how they're built, a lot of information. But we're not going to cover that in this video. I suggest you search for it on your own, at your own leisure. So, capacitors work Basically, in a very, very rudimentary, very basic explanation, a capacitor is like a battery, only it stores a charge for a very short period of time. And yes, they self-discharge as well. What happens when you drain half the acid out of a car battery? Hell, even a small amount. The battery will no longer store and release energy as efficiently as it would had that event not occurred. And the same thing happens to capacitors. What happens when you lose a significant portion of electrolyte in a capacitor? It no longer efficiently stores energy and releases it as efficiently as it should. And that is why washing the board, washing the conductive and corrosive electrolyte off of the board may solve the problem temporarily but it may not last very long because you still have a loss of electrolyte, therefore a loss of efficiency 
within one or all capacitors. Furthermore, that electrolyte is conductive. I think we should harp on that right now. So the electrolyte that leaks out of these caps, it is conductive to an extent. It's, a, it's not a dielectric by any means, but it is conductive, and it is conductive enough to cause weirdness to occur. Not like smoke and flames, like if I were to pour iron oxide all over the board, which I, I did that once, many years ago. It was fun. But what happens is, it causes these low current, very small amount of energy uh, signals to cross and to misfire. And let me talk about what happened to our sound circuit. And this is specifically why we had sound issues even after a recap. Because I did not initially wash the board like I was supposed to. What happened was, these two, these two caps right here, which are just above this sound chip here, Remember, the board sits at an angle, like this, almost like that. So what's going to happen is any leakage is going to come down this way. It's going to leak onto our floppy controller, onto our SCSI controller, onto our sound controller. And that, I believe, is why these three chips are the most problematic when dealing with an old, aging Classic. And if I'm not mistaken, the Classic 2 the memory slots on the board are affected because there's caps just above those as well. So what happened to my classic is the electrolyte from these two caps here leaked underneath this chip right here, which is nestled right in the sound region, the auditory uh, region of the board. And in doing that, it caused an intermittent short between one or many of these uh, contacts or legs. So what I did is I thought about it for a minute and I'm thinking why is it not working? What have I done wrong? And then it wasn't what did I do wrong, it's what did I miss? I didn't wash the board. Oh man, sometimes I am my own worst enemy. But this is a great learning opportunity for you guys, and it helps to explain why these problems occur and why doing this fixes it. So, I took the board out and I used. Oh, this stuff is. I've used this for so many things. This is Dollar Store Degreaser. This is called Mean Green. I bought this at uh, either Dollar General um, or possibly Dollar Tree. And it's a dollar a bottle. And it's, it's great stuff. It works for everything. Why would I use a degreaser? Because the electrolyte is oil-based on these older caps. And uh, I then took, of course, I took this battery. You want to do that. Make sure you, you take your, your CMOS battery out before you do anything like that. I sprayed the board down liberally with, uh, with my inexpensive degreaser. And I took a uh, toothbrush, which I have set aside here. So, oh, here it is. I used this toothbrush to brush for my clock to stop thank you I use this toothbrush right here to brush the entire surface of the board to help loosen up any degreaser to remove dust of course I also did the other side as well I then took a sewing needle and I picked between each of these legs, each of these legs in this chip right here, on all four sides. And I scraped out a lot of, of just buildup, corrosion and buildup and nasty stuff. Cleaned it out and then I took some compressed air and I sprayed underneath the chip. And, well let's take a look, let's see how effective this was. Of course I let the board dry. I put it in the oven at uh, about 200 degrees for 10 minutes or so. And when I took it out, it was dry as a bone. So let's put it in the machine and uh, turn it on and see what happens. But forgetting to wash the board is a, is a very, I think it's a very common mistake, I think. Or at least it is in my house. Um, but this is why you've got to do both. You've got to, re you've got to replace the capacitors to replace and replenish the depleted electrolyte that you've lost. And you've also got to wash the board um, in that same 
in that same procedure, you got to wash the board to remove any of that harmful and dangerous and conductive electrolyte. And that was uh, that's where I went wrong. So you can't have one without the other. You can't just wash the board and expect long-term results. And you can't just replace the caps and expect even positive results. So in my next video, we're going to address the massive amounts of corrosion on this wiring harness connector. And we're going to be using a product called Deoxit. I think I'm going to be using the D100. That's what the company recommended. They're sending me, uh, they're sending me kind of like a welcome wagon kit in exchange for some free publicity. So there you go. In full disclosure, that's what's going to happen there. And we're going to use that stuff to clean up the electrical contacts that are corroded on the wiring harness. And with any luck, this machine will be ready to reassemble. But in further development, um, a gentleman who goes by the name of King Corduroy, that's King Corduroy, didn't ask any questions as to what, maybe he really likes corduroy pants, I don't know. But King Corduroy has offered to send me, for the cost of shipping, a Macintosh Classic with a good shell but a bad analog board. And of course, it also has a faulty motherboard as well, which will need to be recapped. But what I want to do is replace at least the rear half of the shell because there are some some gouges that occurred when I tried to remove some Velcro. I had to use heat to remove the Velcro, and that heat softened the plastic enough to cause me to uh, just slightly nick it in many little areas. And I, I, you know, I'm trying to restore this machine to its almost new condition, and I can't have that. And I just can't have that on my machine. So um, we're gonna fire it up. Now I've already installed 7.1 and uh, I've got at ease installed on this which is a, an application that's used it was primarily used by um, by public educational environments and um, maybe even private educational institutions to kind of lock down uh, their Macintoshes and make them easier for students to use. It adds a nice little menu to the machine. So let's fire it up. You can hear that that startup chime was nice and crisp and you'll probably notice that that startup chime was the same as the original Macintosh. In fact Apple used that startup chime up until the Macintosh Classic and then they went to the multi-tonal um, or polyphonic startup chime uh, in the Classic 2 and I believe the Macintosh 2 had a, a, a shortened version of that for a while. So I want to also point one, one other thing out. If you're not comfortable experimenting um, with surface mount soldering techniques using the wrong tools, um, and you want to restore your Macintosh Classic or Classic 2 or even a LC2, you can do that by sending your motherboard out. There are some people that offer uh, motherboard repair and I believe it was V Westlife who actually did that. He wasn't willing to risk his motherboard by practicing his surface mount soldering skills. Um, so he felt that it was better to just send it out to somebody who could fix it for him. I don't know what he paid for that service. I don't think he disclosed that in his video, but I do know it, it can be expensive. Um, we're talking anywhere from like 50 to 150 bucks. Um, I don't know any actual pricing. I don't know anybody who does this, but I know the service, the service is out there uh, for anyone willing to pay for it. So if you're not willing to, to kind of do what I did and just do it, um, you know, that is an option. So let's go ahead and log into the machine. I did set a password. It was super secret. BAB123. Uh, 
this is the at ease uh, simple interface that just gives you a list of applications that were allowed to be used under that account and it gives you a place to save documents right here on the <clears throat> right with, a, with easy access to you um, this is actually how the Macintosh Classic was was presented to me well to my class um, back in 1994 or 95 um, we had a whole lab full of Mac Classics and they all had at ease running on them and that's that's kind of the the first experience I ever had on a Mac and uh, definitely brings back some memories. So let's play a game that has some sound. So you can hear that the menu has, or the interface, has some interesting sound effects built right in. Now let's open up the uh, control panel and let's hear some sound. So what we're looking for is linear volume control. That is a steady progression or a steady increase in volume as we go up the scale. Okay. Looks so. I was going to say it looks good, but it sounds good. Um, let's go ahead and play a game. What do we have here? Uh, let's open up the. Let's close the control panel. And we're going to go ahead and. <clears throat> uh, how about this one? Uh, Stunt Copter. Stunt Copter is a game that was released for 68k Macintoshes. It works. Uh, it doesn't work so well in anything faster than a classic. Uh, that's eight megahertz. It really likes the eight megahertz speed. If you run it on a classic two, which I believe is sixteen megahertz, it doesn't run very well. Anything faster than that, it's unplayable. Here we go. The object is to drop this guy into the wagon, and the higher you drop him from, the better the score. And I think I missed it. Oh, I got him. Here we go. Now, if I drop him from above the cloud, there's a delayed reaction. The cloud adds like a small delay in his, uh, his descent. So let's... I'm going to kill him. I'm going to show you what that does. So it stays in the cloud for about a second or two, and he dies. So the higher I go, the better the score. And if I, if I think if I drop him in the cloud, the score is even better. And that, my friends, is Stunt Copter. So, you can hear that the, the sound is working great. But how does our floppy drive work? I'm going to exit at ease right now. We're going to go into the finder. And I'm going to just, I'm going to turn off at ease. We're just going to start it back up in the finder. And here we go. So here we go. Let's restart. <clears throat> So while we're waiting for it to restart, let's talk about the Classic. So the, the Macintosh Classic was Apple's most affordable Mac <clears throat> for 1990. And what it really was, was kind of a neutered Macintosh SE. And by neutered, I mean they removed the new bus expansion slot. Um, they removed the, uh, the microphone port all in the name of cost savings. But you could buy a Macintosh Classic without an internal hard drive for $999, and that was, for its time, for a Mac, that was pretty cheap. It was also made during a very, very weak and very bad period in Apple's history, so... It most certainly is not one of the greatest Macs made, but it was also very common. I mean, they made so many of these. They were very popular in educational institutions, colleges, dorm rooms. Um, they were very compact, they were easy to use, and they were relatively reliable for their, uh, for their simplicity. Um, 
Of course, in 1990, buying a computer with a 9-inch black and white display was almost kind of bonkers, uh, especially for a thousand bucks. But it is what it is, and a lot of these still remain because they were pretty well made. But of course, they all have capacitor problems. If you buy one of these on eBay, you buy one on Craigslist, you get one at a flea market, it's going to have capacitor issues whether you like it or not. That's the deal, and you're going to have to replace them. And, and my video series, I hope, can ease some of the tension for some people who aren't necessarily experienced electric, electronics technicians. And I'm not myself. I am not an electronics guy. I just play one on YouTube. Thank you all for watching, and uh, 